Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. We're so excited to see you here this afternoon and welcome you to our Science Cafe with Eric Rogers. We're super excited to receive an update from Eric on his research into understanding longevity and uh, how we can extend healthy lifespans. So we had a great response to this cafe. So we know that's a topic that many of you are very interested in. So it is my great pleasure to welcome Eric Rogers back to our Science Cafe stage. I know many of you are familiar with his work and we're excited to get a little update. It's been a while. I was just reminiscing with Eric that he joined the lab back in 2013. So time flies. I still think of him as kind of one of our new scientists, but <laughs> I guess you've crested that threshold, Eric. That's no longer the case, but <laughs> nonetheless, um, very, very excited to share his work. As many of you may know, Eric is looking, um, studying a wide array of organisms, what we sort of talk about as comparative biology, to understand the mechanisms that are involved in aging and health span, um, and then try to apply that to that knowledge that we learn to human health and in an effort to potentially, um, as I said, really extend uh, lifespan, but also to really understand whether or not it's possible to delay the onset of age-related disease, because that's really, I think, the sweet spot, right? That we want to live as long as we can and, and as well as we can without the threat of degenerative disease. So, Eric, with that, I want to turn things over to you, just welcome you back and say we're, we're super excited to hear your update and learn about what's new in your lab. Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, so welcome everybody. It's a it's a pleasure uh, to be here with you. Um, it has been a while since I've done a, a science cafe, um, and so it's a, a pleasure to come back and talk. And um, today I'm going to tell you uh, sort of uh, a story about my evolving understanding um, of how the field of of aging research is beginning to. Uh, translate into um, real therapeutic options. And so I'm going to, I work in worms, and so I don't do, uh, I work with worms and, and flies and now uh, fish, um, but not with people. I don't uh, carry out clinical studies myself, but I, I do um, have a lot of colleagues um, who have, have used the information that's been garnered in um, model organism studies to be able to develop uh, therapeutics for uh, ameliorating a number of age-related um, uh, conditions in, in an attempt to uh, uh, improve or extend the healthy years of life and, and improve quality of life. Uh, and so just a, a little bit of a background on myself, I, I um, was in another field of science and, and sort of was compelled to get into aging uh, science, uh, when I realized that there were certain discoveries being made that aging was actually plastic. Uh, it was, it was malleable. It was something that could be changed. And I wanted to understand that more. And so in 2005, I went back to school and, uh, got my PhD in, uh, molecular and cellular biology, um, uh, specialized in a mammalian immunology lab. And then from there, I went to work at the Bach Institute for Research on aging. And I did a postdoc there in Pankaj Kapahi's lab, looking at how uh, nutrients uh, and our genes influence health. Uh, and with that, um, the today I, I 
there are, are lots of things we could uh, talk about and it would be easy to, to be overwhelmed. So I, I sort of separated this into to two parts. And the first is aging control. Um, and and that, that is intended to give you an idea of why we actually have the ability to do anything about aging to begin with. Um, and the other is to talk about the, the aging interventions. That's the really fun part, um, uh, I think. So, so what controls how, how rapidly um, we age? So uh, everybody has heard uh, the expression nature versus nurture, uh, I'm sure. Um, and to a biologist, that just means genes versus the environment. What, what contribution of whatever we happen to be looking at, if we're looking at health, what is the contribution from our, um, our lineage, our, our genetics, and what is the contribution of the environment? I can tell you for me, uh, and as I will demonstrate, the, the question itself um, uh, may be a bit misleading um, and, and that uh, this should be looked at from another perspective because neither one exists in, a, in isolation. And yes, you can be born with a, a gene mutation that causes a disease, but by and large, uh, our genes are influenced very strongly by the environment themselves, not just I'm not talking about the sequence of the DNA, but the actual activity of the genes encoded in the DNA. Um, so let's, let's look at our test subjects here. Um, on the upper left here, we have Edwina Brocklesby. Uh, she is uh, 78, and she's the baby here. Um, she is the, uh, of, our, of our group here. She's only 78 years old, but she has a distinction of being um, the world's oldest triathlete. Um, Ida Keeling down in the corner, she is uh, 104 years old and she sprints. And, um, and so, you know, is as far as whether it's genes or, or environment uh, that are responsible for um, uh, her being able to sprint at, at uh, an age over 100, um, a little background on her life. She suffered some um, uh, tragedies in the, in the 70s and, and 80s. She lost both of her sons in Harlem to uh, drug violence. And she needed, she was, you know, obviously very uh, torn apart by this and, and she needed an outlet and she began exercising. And here she's still exercising uh, many decades later. Um, but she's, she's uh, the young one compared to uh, the gentleman on her right, uh, Fauja Singh. He's 108 years old, uh, marathon runner. Uh, he started running in his 80s. Um, now, I'm, you know, he was uh, very active early in life. But interestingly, this gentleman who's 108 years old, he had kind of a failure to thrive when he was young among his uh, siblings growing up. Um, he kind of needed special care because he, uh, he was really having problems. And that might seem kind of unusual that, wow, somebody would have health problems um, that early in life uh, could, could have such a robust health um, and, and make it uh, into their 100s. And, and we'll talk about why that might be uh, you know, how genes in, in this example might be contributing. Um, to that extreme longevity. And then on the, on the far right, we have uh, uh, Winnie Langley. Um, uh, she passed a few years after this, this was taken, but uh, I love uh, trotting Winnie out because she um, is such, has such a, a remarkable example for us of, that's counterintuitive about uh, environment and, and longevity. She's uh, estimated here to be smoking her um, something like 170,000th cigarette. Um, she started smoking when she was uh, uh, six or seven years old during World War I, she said to calm her nerves. Um, and she had been uh, uh, smoking ever since. And um, uh, in fact, uh, was, 
she stopped, she was convinced to stop smoking around the age uh, 101 or 102. And, and within six months, she passed. And some people are absolutely convinced that the reason she passed is that she stopped smoking. Um, I won't comment on, on whether I think uh, there's anything to that. But obviously, it's, it's a very extreme sort of uh, a counterexample of, of a, a behavior, a lifestyle, an environment that uh, we would not normally um, uh, consider is conducive to uh, uh, health and, and uh, um, living with a high quality of life. So all of these people uh, have in common that they're, they're aged and, and they aged very well. Um, but what is, what is the contribution of genes? What is the contribution of environment? And, um, and can we even separate those two things? So I wanna, I, I wanna ask the question, is aging programmed in our genetic code? Do we think it's actually programmed? Um, you will get arguments about this um, from some pretty big uh, people in the field of, of aging research. Um, I always tend to at, look at these questions from the point of view uh, of what did nature intend? Um, and, and that was why I didn't understand uh, when I first found out that aging could be influenced. I, I did not understand why that should be. Why should a, a single gene be able to uh, uh, control longevity or, or um, be able to access extreme longevity with small changes. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pose four non-controversial statements and then ask the question again. So DNA contains a genetic code for life. It's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, we know that certain genes drive growth and reproduction, and that's what you need to sustain a, a species. You need it to be able to grow and, and reproduce and get out the next generation. Now, this one may seem a, a little less obvious, um, and that is the, that the activity of those genes that gr drive growth and reproduction, it depends on the environment. It depends on the conditions um, uh, uh, that exist. Uh, and I think a, a good way to, to bring that point home is to say, well, what would happen if they weren't? What would happen if growth and reproduction happened without any regard to environmental conditions? The, the results would be disastrous because if you try to grow and you don't have sufficient nutrients or the conditions are poor, um, it will be disastrous. You, you will uh, die right then and there. Um, you have to be, in, in, and especially if we're talking about growing, adding mass, reproducing, uh, growing a new, a new generation, um, these things uh, require that conditions are good or they're at least reasonable uh, and that, um, uh, and conducive to, to growth. Um, so if we didn't have that, we know that uh, uh, we'd run into problems right away for, for sustaining, um, uh, sustaining a population. And finally, mutations in growth in reproduction genes can increase lifespan. This one too might seem a little counterintuitive. Um, obviously, growth and reproduction is really, really important. Why in the world would it be that um, small mutation in a, in a gene that was critical for growing and reproducing, why in the world would that increase lifespan? Um, but it does so, sort of invoke the idea that aging is programmed since we know the growth and reproduction genes are programmed um, and that they respond to environmental conditions. So it invokes this, this notion that aging may be programmed. And we can certainly look at different species, different animals, and, and make an argument that's more or less against programmed aging. If we look at the mayfly, when it comes out, uh, it has an early life stage, but then in its final uh, reproductive stage, it comes out no mouth. 
because it ain't going to need to eat because it's it's got a very, very short time to live. Um, males can live for a day or two. Females live for a few minutes. So they come out, they reproduce, and then they are food for the fishes and, and the birds. Um, so there, that definitely invokes that, okay, you know, the, for that to be so sudden, um, maybe there's a program aging, certainly a, a senescence, which we'll, we'll talk more about. And then there's the tortoise. A tortoise um, is very unusual uh, in, in a sense because um, it grows and it, it reaches reproductive adulthood. But then rather than starting to age how we might expect, you know, once you reach reproductive adulthood, it actually, uh, its systems uh, become stronger. It, it grows, its reproductive um, abilities increase. And those are things we, we would associate with increased health um, with age. And so it really uh, seems to kind of counter that, the whole idea of, of programmed aging. So we could get philosophical with it. We could look at, at different species and say, well, this one is more or less uh, seems susceptible to a, some kind of a programmed aging. But what I came to realize once I got in, into the field is the the genes that are involved in the and and the associations with an anti-aging effect or a pro-longevity effect is really more about accessing programs that improve the chance of survival under physiological stress and and you can imagine that would be very very important in in nature if you get to a point you're growing and um, maybe ready to reproduce and conditions are poor, there's not enough food, um, or there are other challenges in the environment that just make it not a great time, um, that's when it's time to go into a survival mode. And why does nature care about that survival mode? Because it wants you to be able to live long enough to be able to grow and reproduce. Now, the really cool thing for us and, and for the whole point of this talk is that these programs can be accessed even when we're done growing and reproducing. And that's the, that's the truly magnificent news, um, at, least, at least to me and, and the reason that I got into aging research. So I wanted to give you one sort of the canonical example and, and the, the, I think the example that kicked off the whole revolution uh, in our understanding of aging. And it started with C. elegans, which is, is near and dear to us in the lab. A wonderful little organism, only lives for a few weeks. Um, it grows to reproductive adulthood from, uh, from an egg in three or four days. And um, uh, this little critter really has been hugely important in um, understanding growth and development. Um, from, from the point of view of developmental biologists. But there was a developmental biologist who was uh, studying in C. elegans back in the early 90s, and her name was Cynthia Kenyon. And she was working with a, a gene called DAF2. And uh, it, the gene was named after um, a, an outcome associated with mutating the gene, which is it would, uh, mutating the gene caused problems with growth and it would arrest growth and, and prevent uh, maturation. Um, and so, but one thing she noticed is that when animals did mature and they had a mutated form of DAF2, uh, that they lived twice as long. Now, just a, a, they didn't know exactly what DAF2 was at first. They could figure out some things from the, the, the genetic code and the protein coding. And they figured out this was a receptor. And it turns out that this is a, a receptor, which is like a, a little receiving molecule, usually on the surface of a cell, that's very much like our insulin receptors or our insulin-like growth factor receptors or our growth hormone receptors. So we have three flavors of this gene. The worm only has one. And lo and behold, a single gene mutation a, sing, a single base substitution. So one 
one little part of the sequence of the gene could change and you could double lifespan. Now, why should that be? Why should that be? Um, you know, that's, that was the big question uh, when I came in and I thought, well, there, there's, a, there's a real story here. And so that was in the early 90s. And by the mid to late 90s, they had figured out that, that DAF2 was the insulin-like receptor in C. elegans sitting on the cell surface. And that depending on, you know, uh, whether in a key engaged the receptor, you know, whether it's what we refer to as a ligand was engaged with DAF2, it would send signals into the cell that said, hey, conditions are good. Um, keep DAF16 out of the nucleus. Now, DAF, why is that important? DAF16, another an, uh, an, an encoded by another gene. Um, it, here is a, it's a protein that's a master regulator of gene activity. And if that thing goes into the nucleus when conditions are poor and those messages aren't transmitted so well from DAF2, it kind of derepresses the, the, the sequestration of this molecule in the cytoplasm and it goes in and it's able to activate hundreds of genes. So it's a coordinated effort to invoke a program for survival. And it's really a strong survival program. In fact, um, worms with mutated uh, DAF2, you can um, throw poisons at them. You can throw uh, radiation, um, heat, uh, salt stress, starve them, you can do all kinds of things. And these, these critters are hard to kill, um, much harder than their normal counterparts. You might wonder, well, geez, with such a small little mutation, how could you get such a dramatic super worm? Well, you don't get something for nothing. And as I said, this, this receptor is really important for growth. And so if you have it chronically uh, mutated so that its activity is depressed. Uh, it's there, but it's, it's very low. It has negative effects on growth and reproduction. And it, in the wild, we, we wouldn't have to worry about this, this worm mutant escaping the lab and taking over in the wild because it would rapidly be outcompeted. So that explains why the super worm doesn't um, sort of take over, uh, but it also gives us a key in understanding into how I would say 90% of anti-aging uh, therapeutics work. And so if, if you want a shorthand, anything that's um, growth hormone sensing, um, uh, lots of growth hormone sensing, if there's lots of sensing of nutrients and energy, those are all signals um, to activate those growth and uh, reproduction proteins. However, if you're missing the growth hormone sensing or the nutrient sensing or the energy sensing, it causes a redirection of your resources away from growth and reproduction and towards survival. And that's what we tap into. Uh, when we, when we uh, create mutants or, or interventions um, that increase lifespan. So that's the, the little backstory. Um, and, and now we get to the, uh, the meat here. Um, is, is the research, uh, and, and there is a lot of research out there now, um, decades now, is it making it to the clinic? Um, short answer is yes. Uh, but, but first, let's go back and think about what I said before. The genes don't exist in a vacuum. Gene activity is informed by our environment. Now, you can mutate a gene or change a gene in order to get its activity to change or you can change the environment to get the activity to change. So we start with uh, lifestyle and it might seem like this is pretty um, uh, uh, tried and true and obvious 
uh, stuff, but there's a lot of power, I think, to uh, when you understand that changes in diet, changes in exercise, sleep, stress, that these things actually change the activity of your genes. And that is why you uh, either have good or bad effects as a result. Exercise, um, probably the most important thing. You have to keep moving if you want to stay, uh, if you want to stay mobile. And, um, you know, uh, this is something I've, I've seen in my own family. Um, you know, I remember my grandmother um, talking to my mom when I was young and she was always concerned or oh, she needed more rest. She needed more rest. Um, but rest is not the key to everything. Yes, you do need uh, a healthful uh, uh, amount of rest, um, but you also need healthy forms of acute stress. And that's what exercise is. It's a type of stress we're extremely well adapted um, uh, uh, to get benefits from uh, and to, uh, 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 to, mold, to adapt to. And we know that um, you know, exercise uh, in, improves mobility, circulation, metabolism, immunity, sleep, mental state, lots of different things. But the, 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 the true uh, miracle uh, of the benefits of it are through something called DNA remodeling. And that is, um, I'm not speaking figuratively, I am speaking literally. Um, one of the most important components of preserving healthful lifespan is preserving the architecture that exists with your DNA inside the nucleus of a cell. Um, it, it, there, are, there is scaffolding on which the, the DNA attaches that's important uh, for changing the accessibility of genes. There are proteins called histones that wind around, uh, the, upon which the, the DNA is wound um, that make certain genes more or less accessible and preserving very tight management and a high quality architecture in that space is key. And in, in fact, some of the progeroid syndromes that exist, exist because of a breakdown in that nuclear architecture. It is tremendously important. And so exercise is one of the most critical ways that we can access uh, uh, this architecture to uh, keep it in good shape. We've all heard probably about uh, dietary moderation. Uh, you probably also heard about dietary restriction, which is actually restricting beyond what, um, what we would normally uh, uh, want if we were to feed until we were completely sated each time. Um, and there are people practicing diet forms of dietary restriction. Uh, more popular now is intermittent fasting. You can get a lot of the benefits of um, these uh, uh, healthy diet uh, interventions just by doing periodic fasting or doing a periodic fasting mimicking diet. Um, so this is a diet that bulk to it, but it's extremely low in calories so low in macronutrients, high in micronutrients, um, very popular. And again, the reason you get benefits from this, the only reason you get a benefit is due to that DNA remodeling. Sleep, um, the, the right amount of time and the time, uh, right amount of time and timing, um, the two crucial parts. So you might think, well, if I get eight hours, it doesn't matter whether, where I get those eight hours. Um, ask a shift worker um, and, and ask their metal, medical practitioners of shift workers. Um, you know, they're, they've uh, done association studies and find that, you know, people who have to work in the middle of the night and try to sleep during the day, they end up with all kinds of metabolic issues and, and health issues. Um, so, you know, uh, we have these things called circadian rhythms in which hundreds or thousands of genes ramp up during one part of the day and they ramp down during another part of the day. And 
in order, and that's a very healthy cycle. And you want to do things to promote that cycle. Well, not getting enough sleep definitely messes with that cycle, as does uh, missing sort of a, a regular schedule uh, or, or, you know, sleeping during the day. Those kinds of things can, can really mess with um, eating at the wrong time, eating before you go to bed in addition maybe having a full feeling um, when you go to bed, it screws up the, the natural cycle. And so that one of the reasons why you don't wanna eat for a couple hours, uh, two, three hours before you sleep. Um, one of the, the things that really drilled home to me, uh, the power of these, possible power of these circadian rhythms. I had a, a friend, um, a colleague of mine, um, when I was doing my postdoc, he was working in flies and yet flies have circadian rhythms too. And uh, flies respond to dietary restriction. You get a nice robust increase of lifespan. What was amazing is when he measured the circadian rhythm genes in the dietary restricted animals, the amplitude of the oscillations were really large compared to the wild type. And to me, that really drove home that uh, you know, having really robust and preserving really robust circadian rhythms, getting good night's sleep um, when it's appropriate to sleep, super important. And again, all comes back down to gene activity. Well, what about gene variants? So you hear, oh, somebody has good genes or bad genes for aging. And there have been a lot of studies looking at uh, the, you know, trying to map areas of the genome, um, trying to find specific genes that are uh, responsible for uh, differences in, in aging. Uh, and it's been done a lot in mice, and it's been done uh, uh, also, uh, you know, to be able to associate uh, with human aging. And there have been association studies that have found some alleles, those are uh, variants of certain genes, that do uh, play a role in, seem to, to have an influence over um, aging in people that may be um, regardless of, uh, or, or at, in which environment plays less of a role. One of the big ones is FOXO3, and that's, that's the analog of that DAF16 I showed you in the worm. So it's another master regulator of, of gene activity. Now we won't talk too much about this. And to be honest, there's not too much you can do about it right now. Um, if you've uh, got one variant or the other, um, you know, that it, it, there's, you know, until we uh, perfect uh, changing our genome in a, in a healthy way, um, that's sort of an, an off limits area. We can do the association studies, but, um, you know, praying that you have a, a longevity associated a, a gene allele is, um, it's not going to do, do very much. But where you can really have an impact in addition to lifestyle uh, is uh, through the potential of therapeutics. And there are so many now. Um, we have metformin, resveratrol, NAD precursors, rapamycin, rhodiola, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, omega-3 fatty acids, green tea extracts, selenium, curcumin, SSRIs, quercetin, synolytics, and that's just to name a few. There's a lot out there. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on a few that I find um, the most compelling uh, and, and provocative um, uh, right now. Oh, and coenzyme Q10. So let's, let's talk about Matt Foreman for a moment um, because this is a, this drug has been around for a very long time, um, and it has been um, uh, proposed now for also for a long time to repurpose this for as an aging drug. Uh, many many of you have probably heard of uh, metformin. Um, if you know somebody who uh, has type two diabetes or a metabolic disorder, um, this is a it's a, a very popular. Uh, uh, diabetes drug and it Im improves the control of blood glucose levels. And um, it's very safe. It is a very, very, you know, compared to a lot of other drugs out there, this is a, a, a very safe drug. 
the, the side effects that people would usually have with it would be uh, diarrhea or cramping. Um, and that's only with some people. Uh, very, very rare and usually only in instances where people have organ failure or um, are extreme alcoholics would you end up with a situation of lactic acidosis. Um, but it's very low on the, uh, tends to be very low on the side effect scale, uh, generally considered quite safe. And the mechanism, it's, it's considered a, a dietary restriction mimetic. And, and dietary restriction is, is the most robust um, environmental intervention for extending lifespan across many different species. So you can imagine if we have drugs that sort of mimic the effect without having to starve yourself, um, that's going to be a very, very popular uh, option for, for a lot of people. Um, and, and the way it's thought to work uh, as a, a dietary restriction mimic is it, it activates a low energy sensor um, called AMPK. Um, and if you're wondering if the, um, if the FDA would ever approve a, a drug for aging uh, or to um, slow aging and, and prevent age-related disease, um, for many years, uh, there's been um, the push to uh, initiate the TAME trial, which is targeting aging with metformin, um, which is a, a, a number of uh, uh, clinical trials um, that'll engage uh, thousands of individuals between the ages of 65 and 79. And what they're looking for isn't whether or not it extends lifespan but whether or not it can slow the snowball effect of comorbidities. You know, once you, you get to 40 years of age, you might be on some medications. You get to 50 years of age, you might be on a few more. And 60 years of age, you might be a few more because there's more things that you're, uh, more systems are, are having problems and there's more compensation or, or uh, uh, treatments that are, are required to um, uh, keep, uh, keep you healthy. Um, or to, you know, uh, uh, keep you alive. And so this is uh, an effort that's been headed by Nir Barsili. And again, it's been going on for years, mostly because they couldn't find funding um, because no drug company wants to touch it. Um, and so they had to, they have to try to raise uh, money some other way, some other ways. Metformin is, is um, obviously it's, you know, off patent now. Uh, and it's very, very cheap. And so, you know, some people are worried that if we have uh, drugs that extend healthy lifespan or, or even extend lifespan that only the very rich uh, would have access. Well, this would be a nice counterexample since it's uh, essentially available for uh, pennies a tablet. Rapamycin. Now, um, this is a this is a, a, a drug I've, I've known about for a long time, but I've only considered it a possible human therapeutic um, probably for maybe the last five years. Um, my, my view changed on it. I, I considered it um, uh, something that would have too many potential side effects, but um, with the right dosing and scheduling uh, of, of, um, of dosing, um, it can be uh, safely, uh, safely used. Um, this is also, this drug is also known as, uh, sirolimus. You, you need a prescription for it. Um, and, and it's, again, we're talking about drug repurposing for, for longevity. It's, um, used as an anti-rejection drug. So people who get a kidney transplant, they take this drug forever. Um, and they do that to prevent, uh, rejection. Now the consequence is that the reason that you don't reject the, the transplanted organ is that you're suppressing your immune system. And so you have to take a, a fairly high dose um, in order to uh, achieve that effect. And it, it turns out that the longevity mechanism may be accessed at a lower dose. Um, but this is another DR mimetic. Um, it's, it's a different type of, of dietary restriction mimic than uh, metformin. Um, and we know exactly what the, the molecular target is inside the cell. It's a, it's a complex uh, called mTOR. 
And normally if you have food, this is a, a nutrient sensor inside your cells. And so if you have lots of food, it activates this uh, complex, this mTOR complex, and rapamycin um, blocks it. It blocks its activation or it lowers its, its activity. And uh, as you can imagine in, in your immune cells, um, you, you know, immune cells are a bit unusual. Uh, well, not entirely, but they, they are a cell type in your body that when activated, they need to um, rapidly proliferate. And if you've got something that's blocking a major nutrient sensor, um, then that's going to have the effect of, of lowering its, um, its proliferation potential. However, there's more to this. There is more to this story. Oh, and by the way, historically here, you see these guys, uh, these big stone heads over here. Um, that's because it was, uh, the compound was originally discovered on uh, some uh, bacteria on this, uh, on uh, what's commonly referred to as Easter Island, uh, also Rapa Nui, um, um, which is where the name rapamycin comes from. So we, we started to get, uh, uh, in the early 2000s, all these um, studies coming out show that in worms that extended lifespan and flies, uh, in single cell yeast, in mice, um, extending lifespan. But there was still this very scary thing. And, you know, if you were to ever talk to your doctor, I'm sure your doctor would prescribe metformin before they would ever prescribe you rapamycin uh, for aging because it's it's big and scary. This is a this is an immune suppressing drug for crying out loud. But it turns out uh, that if you use it correctly, it actually enhances immune function. It resets immune function in the elderly. And that's huge. Um, that right there uh, should, you know, uh, be a big go signal for uh, lots and lots of, of clinical studies to look at this in a number of different, uh, 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 for a number of different uh, conditions. And um, we've seen other examples that there's actually a restoration of function in different kinds of immune cells. So it's not you know, it really depends how you use it, whether or not it's, you know, if you're using it as a chronic suppressor of the immune system compared to if you're using a low dose that sort of um, isn't completely inhibitory or as inhibitory in the immune system or what some, some are doing, uh, some, some modes of, of using the drug um, to take it once a week at, at a higher dose. And it's kind of like uh, akin to a, uh, a weekend fast, um, but with a drug. So those are a couple of drug repurposing uh, examples. What else do we have? Um, a novel anti-aging approach. Remember how I said 90% of the aging therapies out there about tapping into those adaptive responses, uh, the the uh, redirecting your, your resources to um, uh, keep your, your own cells and tissues healthy. Well, there is a, another approach and, and it's to remove a problematic type of cell, um, namely targeting senescent cells. So senescence is when a cell goes into an irreversible state of arrest. In other words, uh, the cell feels it has come under some kind of assault or damage. Maybe the DNA is damaged. And hey, if DNA is damaged, maybe that cell could become cancerous. And so the idea is you've got a, a cell that has identified itself as problematic. It says, okay, put the brakes on. Uh, I'm not dividing anymore. Um, now, what does that mean for its function? Well, its, it's function is, is uh, no longer optimal. And in addition, because it's in this senescent state, it's sending out signals. It's secreting signals. And those signals go to other cells. And if you've got enough of those cells, it's a systemic response. In other words, it gets into your bloodstream and it's telling your entire body that there's a problem and it creates 
a chronic state of inflammation. These are little inflammatory signals. Uh, and so we know hey, a chronic and aberrant inflammation is, is a real problem um, uh, with aging. In fact, that's a whole area that people look at called inflam aging. So, uh, you know, and this can create a, a microenvironment that actually, despite the fact that the senescent cell becomes senescent to stop from becoming cancerous, it actually creates a microenvironment in which other cells can, it can uh, promote um, uh, cancer, uh, development of, of cancer. Uh, and so it, it causes a lot of problems. And so um, what you want is a senescent cell to go away. You don't want those to build up. And so uh, I'm showing here a picture of Professor Judy Campisi um, because out of her lab came the, the, uh, um, the term SASP or senescence associated secretory phenotype, which is this secretion of these inflammatory mediators that are really problematic. And so and, and now if we're targeting senescence, what do we target with? Well, we target it with senolytics. And these are compounds that will tell the cell to commit suicide, um, that it needs to go away and, and will help uh, kick, up, kick off a program called apoptosis, which is, uh, induces a, a cell death. And so um, a Dr. Jim Kirkland, uh, who will be here actually this, uh, this summer for a course I'm running, um, he's sort of the, um, the guru uh, on the clinical side of synolytics. And um, uh, he is involved uh, in clinical trials and, and tests. His, his uh, popular combination of drugs is a, it's a cancer drug called a satinib uh, combined with quercetin, which is a, something you can, uh, a supplement you can buy over the counter. But um, what's truly remarkable is that there's another supplement out there called fisetin. Um, and fisetin is almost as efficacious as this cancer drug and quercetin. And it's, there's no side effects. Um, so it uh, uh, truly has remarkable potential, but this, you can go and buy fisetin over the counter, no problem. The only problem is it's new enough that um, I've had trouble finding anywhere where you can uh, get quality testing done um, uh, or observe that quality testing has been done by uh, manufacturers. But you can see uh, from some of the clinical trials here, um, we have alleviation of fisetin, uh, alleviation by fisetin of frailty, inflammation, and related measures in older women. Um, we have people looking at cellular uh, senescence and COVID-19 long hauler syndrome. Uh, senescence and chronic kidney disease, uh, sen uh, cellular senescence with senolytics to improve skeletal health uh, in older humans. So there's a lot of, of age-related um, um, applications here uh, involved in, in targeting and eliminating senescent cells. One more, I, I've got to uh, mention, um, just because it is, is so uh, prevalent right now. And um, it's uh, something called NAD precursors. Uh, you might have seen these marketed as NMN or uh, nicotinamide mononucleotide, NR, nicotide, uh, nicotinamide riboside. Um, there's no prescription involved. These are uh, precursors of a, um, uh, a molecule that is um, abundant inside your cells, although it becomes less abundant with age, but it's, it's critical in cellular bioenergetics and adaptive uh, stress responses. Uh, it, it does get depleted in, in age-related diseases. Um, as I said, it go, it, its levels go down with age, and so the idea is that you're replenishing uh, these age-related losses. Um, the, the science behind it is, I think, is, is, is good. Um, the problem is the, the testing that's been done. Um, and, and now it has, is just, there's so many uh, different companies selling it. Um, nobody seems to be interested in, in uh, doing um, thorough clinical trials 
um, with the stuff. And again, clinical trials, I know they, they, they cost a lot of money. Um, but that's, a, I would get more excited about it. I've heard anecdotally from uh, people who, who've tried it, um, who, who think it, it is uh, effective. Um, but this is one I, I it wouldn't be my number one top, but definitely one worth watching. And, and boy, are you going to, there's been such a push for this out there that it's, it's everywhere. David Sinclair is a very famous um, uh, uh, anti-aging uh, scientist, um, uh, Harvard professor, and he's been pushing this. And his, uh, his mentor, um, Lenny Garenti at MIT, uh, uh, really pushed this as well. Um, and they, you know, they have, um, they're very high, high profile individuals. So they've got a lot of cell science and nature papers. There's definitely something to it. We just need to see what the uh, final effect uh, will be. And I wanted to, I wanted to end with something that was uh, not a, a drug or, or a supplement, uh, but another type of therapeutic um, that's quite interesting. I, I find quite interesting, this hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Now, this is something that uh, Mayo Clinic is already using for all of those conditions you see uh, below, uh, anemia, um, carbon monoxide poisoning, decompression sickness, non-healing wounds, uh, gangrene, radiation uh, injuries, uh, skin grafts, burns. And the idea uh, that's been put forward for why this has a positive effect is that, well, you get the you saturate tissue, you supersaturate your tissues um, by going into a compression chamber with 100% oxygen and, and a couple, two, three atmospheres of pressure. And you really supersaturate your, your tissues with the oxygen. And maybe this allows something to happen. I know from the point of view of infection that that could have a very deleterious effect on microbes. Um, you're, it's presumably that extra oxygen is going to increase the production of uh, rat, uh, reactive oxygen species, which can be used as an um, anti-infective. Um, but um, the idea that you're increasing oxygen and that's, that's allowing healing on its own to happen, I, I, I feel like there's something sort of missing. I have my own theory for why this, this might work, and it has to do with uh, an, uh, a concept known as hormesis, um, which is actually the same idea as uh, why you get therapeutic benefit from any, any kind of acute uh, stress, you get a benefit from like exercise. Um, you're actually, for a very short time, you're increasing um, uh, damage and, and or sensing of, of damage even in the, in the absence of actually doing serious damage. And, and part that might be uh, part of the therapeutic effect, but we're awaiting uh, more results from this, but this has really been pushed uh, uh, by an Israeli scientist uh, for aging studies. And, and there really could be something, um, uh, something to this. So um, that's, that's on the horizon. And with that, I'll, um, there's lots of other compounds we could talk about, but um, I'll, I had to limit it to uh, a smaller number, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Eric, this is terrific. Thank you so much. It's exciting to see so many new uh, therapeutic options come out. You know, I think for probably five or six years ago, there were only just a couple, so you can see how quickly the field is moving and how uh, probably the demand for this is incredible. Um, we have just a couple of questions in the chat, but I want to run by you first, and then I have a couple questions myself. So um, first of all, a couple questions from Andy. When is the TAME trial expected to read out? And just a note that it would be great if and when aging is classified as a disease. So they, I will, they've had the FDA approval for years. Um, and it was just a matter, my understanding, and again, I'm not involved in this uh, study uh, near Barcelli at uh, Einstein, uh, at Albert Einstein is, is the one who's uh, initiated all of this. My understanding is they do have the, the funding or at least initial funding. Um, I don't know exactly what we've been waiting so long. We've been hearing about TAME for so many years now and we are so excited, but every year we're like, okay, is it gonna start now? Is it gonna start now? 
Um, and they, they're able to get away with having a small number. 3,000 people is a relatively small number uh, for, for a clinical trial. Um, but the reason that they can do that and still get statistically significant results is because they're looking at, a, at many different um, uh, morbidities, many different kinds of, of age-related maladies at the same time. Fascinating. Okay, a couple of other questions have come in on the chat here. Um, one, are there any novel drugs in development that you're particularly excited about? I'm a toxicologist in drug development and would love to participate in developing anti-aging therapeutics. What was, what was the first part? Are there any novel drugs in development that you're particularly excited about? I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about the, the senolytics. Um, I think that's, that's a very uh, interesting and compelling um, area right now. And um, there's, you know, there's not just one, one scientist who's, who's studying this in, in mice or something. There's many scientists. Uh, who've been studying. There's many scientists who've looked now at, or sev several who've looked at fisetin, and fisetin's available to us. We can get it, you know, we can go get it, and there's, it, it's not, a, as far as we know, there's no, no side effects from it. So, uh, as I said, that's one of the things I'm the most excited about, um, but um, uh, the, the, the only detraction right now is that we don't know how uh, there, there's not a bunch of quality uh, control that you can look at if you're buying it over the counter. If you're getting it in the in the lab to do a study, then you buy it at an exorbitant rate from a, a you know a company that specializes in 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 uh, uh, selling drugs. But and you know that has a high quality. But for the consumer, you need sort of this um, second party independent uh, verification before you can really feel confident. Am I really getting? 1200 milligrams, you know, in this, in this dose, but, um, the, the, what's interesting about the, the senescence, uh, the senolytics is that, um, they can exert their influence in just a few hours and, um, and then over the next few days, the, the cells, the cells die. So it's, you don't necessarily have to take it every day. They, in fact, some of the dosing that they're doing is, um, only for a couple of days. It's like a periodic uh, dosing every every week or every several weeks or several months, um, and that's that's similar to what some people are doing with uh, with rapamycin. Mm -hmm. I, I, as I said, rapamycin is one that I've I've become much more excited about in the last few years. Um, now that I've gotten kind of past my own prejudices or, or assumptions about it and have looked at it a, a little more closely. Eric, your comment about kind of making sure that what you're buying is, you know, the authentic thing and, and the right thing. I mean, that is one question I have for you. Are there certain signature things that you look for? I mean, there's so many sort of um, imposter products out there around aging, right? And so how do we educate ourselves about what are legitimate, you know, products versus not? That's a, that is a real challenge, and I I finally bit the bullet about a year ago, and I I signed up um, to be a member of this consumer lab uh, group, and they do testing of of different products, and uh, you know they kind of have this pass fail, and they look at many different categories. Um, and I tried to get them, they say you can give them suggestions. I tried to get them to do Fisetin a, a year or so ago, and I didn't hear back from them. But now that it's growing, you know, it used to be just a short time ago, there was only one product out there. Uh, and now there's, there's tons and it's, it's growing rapidly. So I think there's going to be, uh, eventually we will be able to get, uh, a little better, uh, uh consumer, um, knowledge out there about this and, and what are the good good options. Okay, great. Chuck, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you, Eric. That's a delightful uh, bringing together of a lot of information. Uh, early on, you mentioned progeria and the various forms of progeria. In the things that you were looking at and are looking at, could you speak a little bit about potential correlations with the gene allele variants that one finds in progeria and your aging, anti-aging work? 
Yeah. So one of the so this is a become now a big focus at the um, National Institute of Aging uh, um, among the uh, National Institutes of Health. Um, to this this idea, you know, we uh, we have uh, progeria, this the syndrome in which there are children that have uh, the appearance of 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 somehow aging even while they're still uh, growing. And their, their organ systems look like aged organ systems. Well, the, the mutation that causes um, uh, progeria, uh, one of those mutations is a lamin gene, which is basically a, a structural gene uh, inside the nucleus. So this, this gene that is, appears to be, you know, you would think, oh, it's a scaffold, it's a, it's a structure, you know, that's boring, right? That, how is that going to influence gene activity? It's hugely important. And what we figured out is one of the things that happens as we get older um, is that gene expression becomes more uh, stochastic, more erratic. There are some genes whose activity tends to go up, some that, that tend to go down, and, and it, and and also spread. Um, there's just, there's a greater level of variance and, and spreading happening. And one of the things we know is you need very precise gene control, um, not just for different conditions, but depending on the particular tissue uh, that, that is, uh, that you're in, you know, that, that can have its own sets of genes that are active and, and inactive. And we see that as these structural components break down, um, as regulation of uh, histones and um, uh, histone uh, acetylation and methylation, um, as these things break down that are responsible for maintaining the architecture uh, within uh, that on which the, uh, the DNA is, is sort of balanced. Um, this is a, a huge driver of, of, of aging. And so anything that we can do to kind of keep that regulation very tight um, and youthful, uh, that seems to be a, a, a really important aspect. And it, again, it's, it was kind of surprising, you know, that, that it was, it's the architecture and how the, how the DNA is packaged that, uh, that, that really uh, matters. But a lot of these adaptive therapeutics, uh, adaptogens, um, if you will, uh, they're going to um, help strengthen um, the, the sort of the 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 status of that architecture and it and um, also its resilience to uh, and and malleability in in response to environmental changes. So you're suggesting a potential trigger for setting that uh, off, so that your structural materials are then going to be kicked down, as it were. Yeah, and I mean, there's you know, we I talked a little bit about programmed aging. Um, there are this idea of programmed aging uh, in worms, which are very short-lived when, when they go into, uh, first go into adulthood and they start to transition into a reproductive phase, they actually change the way they change the nuclear architecture by um, uh, a key methylations in the, among the, the histones on, on which the DNA is, is wrapped that make certain genes more or less accessible. And the ones they make less accessible are the ones that are really important for responding to stress. And, and presumably this is because they want to redirect all effort at that point, gung-ho into reproduction. I mean, they, they can lay up to 300 eggs in, in a matter of, of days, and then that's it. There's no parenting involved. They lay the egg, they try to lay it in some, some area that has some food, but that is their reason for existence, you know? So at, at that point, they really don't care about their own resilience or nature doesn't care about their resilience. Um, the cool thing is, is that you can reverse it. You know, you can, you can go and take a worm, it's hitting reproduction and with a dietary change or, or with, by feeding it something that actually changes the activity of, of genes, you can actually reverse that and get back all access to all those stress response programs. It's amazing. <laughs> Eric, just a couple of other questions um, in the chat. Jane says, some say that metformin blunts, blunts the hormonic effect of exercise. What are your thoughts about that? 
Uh, I've heard that too. Uh, I think, um, I, I don't know. I mean, is it, is it possible that, um, the, that any blunting that was done would somehow be, uh, uh, would come end up with a, a net effect that was less than ha having both, um, doing both, you know, because they're both doing positive things. Um, maybe that has to do with the timing of when you, uh, when you take, uh, the metformin, but there it's, that's possible. Um, that is possible because metformin is not only acting in your liver. I, that's, that's one of the tissues where we think we're getting the main benefit is, is the, the uh, action of metformin in the liver, but it is also can be affecting your muscles and other tissues. And so that is, it's definitely something to consider. I don't know, honestly, how big of, of an effect that is. I, uh, it's not something I, uh, it's something I'm interested in, but I'm, I'm not actually, uh, fretting about. Um, so, but it, it bears, uh, it bears watching and, and it may have to do with, uh, again, timing of when you take, when you so take, take the it drug. at night, potentially. Mm. Yeah. So not around the time you're, you're exercising. I mean, that might be the way to, the way to do it and, and exercising, to be honest, is doing a lot of the stuff that you want the metformin, uh, to do. So uh, if you were separate, you're strategically separating your therapeutics throughout the day, maybe you separate the, uh, the two of those. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let's see, Abigail is wondering, what's the state of research into the role of, into the role of chromosome end deterioration in aging? So maybe telomeres? Ah, telomeres, yeah. Um, well, so that's, that's important. And that was one of the first big um, ideas or, or uh, things that uh, caused people to envision uh, that they might, um, uh, you know, uh, extend lifespan or even live forever by uh, just being able to add telomeres uh, back to the ends. And, and, we, and there are association studies showing that telomere status uh, does vary with lifestyle. Like, so if you've got a, a healthier lifestyle, you tend to have more uh, telomerase activity and, and more uh, uh, telomere uh, length at the end of your chromosomes. And if you're a couch potato, it was the opposite. Um, as far as a therapeutic goes, that's one where uh, I think it's a good diagnostic, but it's not necessarily, not necessarily um, a great uh, therapeutic target because if you just willy nilly start adding telomeres to the end of cells, you, you could end up with cancer or transforming a, a cell. So, you know, that's, that's the whole idea of cellular immortality. That's one of the things you need is to keep replacing, uh, uh telomeres on the ends because otherwise, uh, there tends to be a, they get shorter, right. Um, with, with cell divisions and apparently with, with lifestyle. Mm. Interesting. Okay, and Charles has a question. I noticed, is it APOE in one of your slides? Anything you'd like to mention about this? I'm currently in a clinical trial related to this. Oh, yeah, so um, uh, APOE, uh, uh, th this is one of the, the uh, genetic variants. Um, I, it's not an area in which uh, I, I'm an expert and, and again, so just a little history on me. We, we have familial Huntington's disease and I, I think I've dodged it, um, but it's, it's one of those things where, what can you do about it? And if you have the allele, um, you know, maybe you, maybe you take better care of yourself if you have an allele that's associated with disease or maybe you feel good if you've gotten a, a one that's associated with a low incidence of, uh, of of mortality or of um, Alzheimer's or something like this. Um, I don't, I just don't have a lot to say uh, about it other than it is one of the strong, it is among, out of all of the genes that have been looked at, thousands and thousands of genes, it is something that does tend to come up with some frequency, very important for uh, hu aging human health. Okay. And I think Great. I would leave it at that. <laughs> Okay, that sounds good. Um, let's see, and just one additional question here. Do the same factors that affect DNA expression also affect mtDNA expression? Uh, 
they it can. Um, so uh, mitochondria, the, my, I'm, I'm guessing MT is mitochondria here from whoever's asking the question. Um, so mitochondria has its own genome, right? Um, but most of its genes, most of the genes that are that are specific to uh, the the a function or the the um, the organelle of mitochondria are encoded in the nucleus, and so there's this balance between what is synthesized that's in the mitochondrial DNA for mitochondria and what's in the nucleus that's for the mitochondria. When those things get out of balance, it induces something called the mitochondrial unfolded protein response. And this, it's, it's meant to rebalance the stoichiometry of what's being produced in the, in the nucleus to match what's being produced uh, by, by the, uh, in the mitochondria. But one of the interesting effects is it seems to be, there's a lot of evidence that in, in uh, certain conditions that actually promotes health to, uh, to sort of activate that response. You need to be careful about activating, chronically activating stress responses, but there's, uh, there's a, a worm guy named Andy Dillon who's been really big um, looking at this stuff and it's it's definitely one of the areas of interest um, for aging research and uh, mitochondria are hugely important uh, for health and um, it, mitochondrial dynamics, especially in, in muscle tissue, um, is is uh, hugely important for functionality uh, in association with sarcopenia and frailty later in life. So um, I, I don't I don't know exactly about any drugs that specifically target mitochondria, but there are drugs that uh, might target components that would activate the, um, the unfolded protein response, the mitochondrial unfolded protein response I spoke of. So there's, there's definitely potential there too. Eric, that's terrific. Thank you so much. There's so much information to, to you know, take in in your presentation. It's really exciting. Um, I think my big takeaway is exercise, exercise, exercise. Right. That's something. Stay that mobile. Know. Keep moving. <laughs> Stay Keep moving. mobile. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing. You know, these updates are really exciting. And again, we will um, pass along some of this info in our follow up with everyone. I want to just remind folks that our next. Um, Science Cafe will be April 11th, where we'll be shifting gears a bit and talking about climate change, uh, sharing some examples of some really great uh, proactive activities and things that have been happening here in the state of Maine around climate change. So I hope you'll plan to join us then. And in the meantime, we will share the recording of today's uh, lecture with all of you. And thank you again so much for joining us. And thank you to Eric for uh, sharing a great presentation with us. Thanks, Eric. Thanks.